Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we're talking about the importance of nonprofit board leadership and the work of Relief International with John Gage, who was a board member of Relief International and served on a number of different boards and had a number of different business roles. John, thank you so much for participating in this discussion. I'm so looking forward to chatting about the, these different aspects of, of your board career, but also the business career and how that has informed your board service. Well, it's a great pleasure, Mark. And you deal with so many boards and so many different forms of non-governmental organizations, international ones, national ones, uh, trying to bring talent from outside an NGO onto a board and integrate it with the functioning of the NGO is a, is a huge challenge. Yeah. So, John, I, I got to know you as, as kind of a, uh, a celebrity in the tech field um, through your work at, at Sun Microsystems. Could you talk a little bit about that work, the, the whole idea of, of creating what today is now the network being the computer, um, which is uh, your phrase, which is how I actually got to know you. Talk a little bit about those early days at Sun and then talk about how you have you've segued from from that sort of operating activity and the technology space into that board leadership role that you've had over the last years. Well, part of it's a technical story, and part of it's a story of luck and being at the right place at the right time, I suppose, when we were just 15 graduate students working on a form of an operating system called Unix, which had generated from the University of California at Berkeley and from AT&T, uh, we made this powerful software free, open. You could download it. And oh, around the world, tens of thousands of, of locations with expensive computers did that. Well, as time went on, the gigantically expensive machines turned into chips, single chips. And the moment you had a single chip, you could run exactly the same software on that single chip as you ran on a Prey supercomputer. You could run the same programs. So that cost reduction, a factor of 10, possibly a factor of 100, altered the technical direction. We turned a group of graduate students into a tiny company but behind the tiny company was a community of tens of thousands of most highly technical sites around the world, computer science faculties, telecommunications companies, banks that were using this software already. So in the, in the commercial phrase, selling something to someone who already is using it and likes it is the right way to do things. So we went from 15 graduate students to a $25 billion company 40, 45,000 employees. Um, partially it was the technology, partially it was just being at the right place at the right conjunction of ways to bring costs down and increase the capabilities of the systems. And you know, what's it, what's really interesting about what you did is that um, you took something, you made it free, you distributed it for free, but then the expertise required to actually run these systems, to make them sing, to make them actually have an, have an impact, that expertise was, uh, came at a cost. And that was basically what you did. You, you, create, you assembled people who could take these, quote, free elements and make them effective, actually make them deployed in ways that were useful to other people. And that's what that's what built those businesses. And as a matter of fact, if you take a look at a lot of the, the infrastructure that makes up the large companies, whether it's Meta today, Facebook or Twitter or uh, Google, a lot of those components are free similarly, and it's how they are being used and how they are being knit together. Not all of those components are free, but a, a lot of this is about how these these uh, companies are being knit together in a way that is similar and evolved version to what you and your colleagues created in those in those days. Well, you know, and, and a key element of this, you're correct, assembling that talent. But we assembled people whose names we didn't know. That's this power of today, open systems, uh, the movement in in science, data science to allow everyone to not only see the data, but operate on the data to recreate scientific results, to check and validate what people are claiming is true. That openness 
uh, brings in a, into the into the conversation, assembles talents around the world in corners of the world you may never visit, you may never know, but it all forms a new community. And I, I think that that's the challenge for NGOs. When any NGO is attempting to reach out and describe their mission and describe the purpose and their function, they're trying to reach people whose names they don't know, trying to join those that have a common interest into a common purpose. And so doing that is uh, brings, uh, again, it's some of some of its luck, uh, but a lot of it, I think, is is setting it setting it up in a way that allows people to participate that might never otherwise have a chance to participate. So in a similar way, the value chain of an NGO is not in, if, if, if one is providing sanitation services, it's not in the pipes. It's not necessarily in the hardware. That is part of the value chain, but it, but the, the big part of the value chain is the human value chain. It's the connecting of people with knowledge to people with need, and then also recognizing the people who have need also have knowledge. So you're sharing knowledge in order to solve problems together. Isn't that quite similar to what you did in your earlier career? Oh, I love that explanation. That's exactly right. And uh, technology changes quickly and uh, understanding what components of some new, let's say it's a water sanitation product. If there's a new mechanism to kill microbes in an otherwise polluted uh, water source, and it can be achieved at a low cost, someone in the world is working on that right now. When they've, if they've succeeded, how can that suddenly be knowledge used by everyone else in the world? How can you set a structure up that allows that? In the Relief International case, it's an entity that functions by design in the most fragile environments. <laughs> Somalia is not an easy place. South Sudan, not an easy place. Sudan, not an easy place. Bangladesh, uh, uh, Syria, uh, Yemen. Those are the areas where a slight change in capability to bring clean water, treat water, change the way food is distributed can make an enormous difference for people. So uh, I suppose a parallel between the early days in a technical company like Sun Microsystems, where you're every moment trying to see how a change in technology brings down costs or makes something more secure, could be transferred into the world of water treatment, sewage treatment, provision of food. Could we make a slight difference here that could cause a large change for the better? Is part of the key here respect for different forms of knowledge that go into a solution? One of the things that that I've uh, been aware of is as you're analyzing how NGOs function, is that there there is a a transition underway from what I've uh, sort of tagged as a neo-colonialist model in which people with capital, people with stuff, right sit at a, at, in, in the hierarchy at a higher level than people who are on the ground, right? But we've seen so many failures where the knowledge of people on the ground has not been respected and where that balance has not been achieved in which colleagues are sitting around the table solving a problem with different forms of expertise. In many respects, this is very similar to the thing that unleashed the creativity in the tech sector, where people stopped looking at things as, and you saw it in, in tech companies, where you had a very egalitarian uh, culture for a very long time, and people just solved problems and had joy in solving problems. Are, has, has the INGO uh, field, is that undergoing a shift to a, a place where uh, there's much more respect for knowledge that is local? And it might take a different form, but that knowledge is invaluable to the solving of these problems. Are you actually changing society as you're as you're together developing solutions? Well, I think that's a profound point. One of the one of the complicated uh, ways in dealing with your own team in a technical company is to uh, watch for signs of. We've done it that way. We've tried that already, and it didn't work. I mean, just in the broad brush, we were 15 graduate students starting Sun, 
And we, we took tens of billions of dollars out of IBM because they did not realize they had to change the way they did business. And we were just kids and didn't know any better. And we had, just solved problems. We just solved problems. And it what's and then the, uh, there would be a ramification of solving that problem and then another ramification. Had you been resistant to trying the new thing, trying what the kids suggested, listening to the voice on the ground in, in Sudan in a clinic who said, you know, try something didn't quite work right. Try this. If you don't listen to that because you feel this is a problem with having white hair in a sense, <laughs> you know, you've seen so many propositions and so many things that seemed hopeful that didn't work. You have a tendency to regard the next one as, you know, well, let's be a little cynical about it. If instead you embrace attempting something new, then there's an opportunity to make an alteration in the complete under, uh, underpinning of the, sol of the problems you're attempting to solve. So I think your point is exactly right. The, the fix, you know, have a joy in solving a problem, accept other people's attempts to solve that problem. And that gives you a new pathway beyond what you've somehow settled into uh, as your organization has been working to do something different. That's such a great observation. In a sense, you're, you're saying that now that you're the gray eminence, you're trying to resist having the attitudes of those IBM guys um, at the beginning of your career, so that as you're coming in, you're opening yourself up to the exposure that you're receiving from people on the ground who are more knowledgeable than you in their in their field of expertise. So talk a little bit about Relief International, about your work and how you've been exposed to people on the ground who know way more than you do, um, where, where your work as a board member and the work of experts who are part of the Relief International staff combined with people who are on the ground can actually solve these big problems that we're all facing? Well, in, in my case, it, it came uh, as an outgrowth of a project I started just as a computer guy. Uh, looking at the schools in California, it struck me that the telephone companies were providing some connectivity, but to try to link across a phone system into the internet was a very expensive and didn't really... <laughs> It was terrible. It didn't it was slow. It didn't work. Work very well. So, it struck me that there's knowledge at every school, in a primary or a secondary school, living around the school, or people who went there. They know how the lockers are set up. They know where the art classroom is. They know where the leak in the roof is. There's knowledge because you're part of that community. So I thought, why don't we try to draw upon the expertise locally? people that are electricians, people plumber. Let's do something on one day to bring to all 19, 20,000 schools in, the, in Cal. Let's bring network connectivity. Well, how could we do that? So I, I said, so here's how we could do that. At each school, form a committee. Find one crazy physics or PE teacher or music teacher that's interested in the internet. And on one day, let's call it net day, let's have everybody arrive at the school bringing some ethernet cable. And it costs almost nothing for ether. In fact, everyone locally has a reel of it in the back garage from their finished installation. Bring the wire and just install the wire in the school to link one location in the school out to all the classrooms get a ladder. So we called it net day. And on net day across all of California in tens of thousands of schools, groups of self-organized parents showed up and wired the school. And we published how to do it and the illustrations, little videos and so forth. It's not hard. Just you're running low voltage wire through the drop ceiling. <laughs> so that net day event suddenly made me realize and made a lot of people realize that the talents locally, uh, a kid that had helped, you know, somebody who, who had wired a local uh, uh, restaurant 
knew how to do it. Every, electricians. So the knowledge was out there. It just needed a way for people to assemble themselves. And so using the network, and putting a map up of every school in California, it allowed someone to find their school, touch it, and then join a conversation of other people at that school interested in wiring that school. Simple. So it spread. 10 or 20 countries ended up doing net days where people would come. They had to, some were authoritarian countries, some were highly organized one way or the other. But everybody, every parent had an interest in altering the environment in their school. Well, that little organization was uh, went on. Uh, and then at one point, a separate organization, and many of NGOs have this same history where people working on different projects joined together. There was another entity that was a group of retired Peace Corps volunteers. And so volunteers in service with water around the world that had been Peace Corps volunteers had an organization. So he joined the school organization with the Peace Corps volunteer organization. And then there were a few other sort of technical, how could you build a well, technical uh, VISTA volunteer level knowledge. So that all formed into ultimately into Relief International, whose focus was essentially twofold. When there's a disaster, get medical care, get everything there on site instantly within 24 hours to an earthquake or a tsunami. After the first week at a death dealing, devastating episode uh it's a disaster things change now the dead are dead rebuilding creating an economic foundation every shipping every fishing boat is destroyed now how do we rebuild the fishing industry in a tiny village in indonesia so that double Double stand, double that double challenge of how do you react to a disaster was the creation of Relief International. You know, Part the thing that I think is so fascinating about this story is that when you look at our lives, our different lives, our lives give us knowledge. You had had a career in which you took uh, um, code and you made it free, and then you built a company with your colleagues out of providing the services to manage that code and to shape that code and to deploy that code. In essence, you're taking the same kind of things, those little components, the ethernet cables that you were referring to in the schools, they're not free, but they're almost free. They're very, they're ubiquitous, right? And then you say, okay, we have experts here who understand the school, the layout of the school, where the wiring can be pulled and so on, where you're going to site the equipment. So you collaborate. Now, each of those people are experts in their own right. And then you take that and you extrapolate that to other countries. And then you extrapolate that from Ethernet code to pipes, to sanitation. And then you extrapolate that to the destruction of a fishing fleet. And the, the people who were fishing are experts in what they need. Right. So you're basically taking your ideas that come out of commerce and you're applying it within a nonprofit setting. How does that shift when you're being in a role on a company where you're where you're in management and you, you have operating responsibility versus the role of a board member? Because you're not necessarily doing the day to day operations. How, how does that role shift? How did you experience that? Well, that is definitely one of the most tricky components of this. Moving from a role in a hierarchical organization where engineers working on storage or security or some component, there's a schedule, there's a budget, people know what they're expected to do. There's structures of rewards. There's the same structure for people, for sales people and marketing people, the different components of a company, the logistics. And the metric element. is profit at the end of a quarter, right? So you, you have a very simple metric, right? A, a simple metric. And you've crafted it in a way to incentivize people to do the right thing. Did we have a high error rate in making this particular part on the assembly line? Did some, when we tested later, was there a greater failure? So each of the steps that you're doing to make something and to sell something, both hardware and software, have metrics. 
in an NGO world where very often your target is let us stop carbon emissions, let us change access to clean water for a child in Somalia, let's alter the education system for girls in Somalia. It's much more complicated. <laughs> Technology is simple. People are hard and not using the expertise about people at a locality where you're attempting to do something is disastrous. And so the, the uh, board role on the one hand is to oversee how the staff and in, in Relief International's case, uh, we're about 98% local hires, volunteers and hires. So we, in, in Somalia, in the girls education program, all of the participants in the program are Somali. There are one or two program managers here and there because the money is coming from the United Nations or UNESCO or World Bank or some entity that needs to have a bureaucratic interface to the flow of money and, and program management. But on the ground, it's people from Somalia, people from Sudan running the programs. Now, how does a board exercise without too much micromanagement, some form of guidance. And in general, it's hands on. The problems in fragile communities, uh, we have big security problems. People get killed uh, in almost in, in all areas where we operate. In almost all areas where we operate, there's someone with a gun who's interested in getting money from you. Right. Now, a board can monitor how you prepare for emergencies and disasters and attacks on your personnel, but there's no way to implement a completely successful. So you're trying to blend knowledge you might have about a specific area with the re realization you've got to keep your hands off because you really will never understand fully what's going on in a particular political situation. A top-down so, approach could be very humbling. Very uh, humbling. Because you, you suddenly realize how ignorance can have real human costs. That's exactly right. And it's so easy in such, a diff such different cultures to misunderstand. You may intuitively think, oh, well, all we need to do is put an armed guard at the gate. No, that the armed guard is the brother of someone. The, so if you don't know that, you really have not made a, an adequate analysis of what the situation is. The brother is. of somebody might be in a competitive situation with somebody else and might have enemies and, and so on and so forth. Yes. The other thing that I think is really interesting is that nonprofits privatize cost, right, and socialize benefit. Businesses mm. generally privatize benefit and socialize costs. Right? <laughs> if I'm using plastic wrap, I'm socializing the cost to the environment of the fact that once I've used that plastic wrap one time, that plastic wrap goes into the environment and it hurts us all. But I get the benefit of using the plastic wrap, right? And you see that in businesses throughout and in private lives, in my own private life. When I put gas in the tank, I'm going to throw carbon into the air. If I use a battery-powered car, I'm going to be promoting the mining that extracts the lithium for the battery. So I'm socializing costs and I'm privatizing the benefit. Nonprofits work precisely in the other direction. What kind of, of concerns do you have? Because when you're on the board of a private entity, you are actually trying to socialize costs, if you can, make costs general and privatize benefit so that your shareholders get the most, quote, value, unquote. In the nonprofit sector, you're, you're, you're doing a totally different act here. You have different yeah, responsibilities. And one of the complicating factors, but a foundation in this particular form of NGO, this international NGO that Relief International is, the flows of support that you would need to provide a girl 
in in Pakistan submitted in, under the floods to try to get that girl's inundated school back operating, operating. you need resources. And right. at this point, you've you can reach out to the general world for individual support and you try your best to do that. But the flows from USAID, from the Danish relief organizations, the Swiss organizations, the Japanese organizations, the United Nations, the World Bank, the European Union, all of those entities have programs. So you find yourself providing answers to requests for proposals from the funding agencies. And there you're dealing with people who have been, well, in Sudan as an example, there's a, a ECHO, the European Union's form of support for humanitarian relief. Think Darfur, think clinics and machine guns on the back of pickups. The, the people that have the, whose careers are spent in Khartoum or in Darfur, Darfur, administering these programs, everyone knows everyone. So the uh, Relief International staff and the European Union staff and the USAID staff, people all know each other. And actually, there's some movement from one group to the other. So everyone has a field report to support the headquarters report to send to head. Everyone has a field report to send to headquarters detailing their successes and perhaps their failures. They're all evaluating each other. They're administering the flow of money. And in, in, in this practical problem of how do you fund, provide resources uh, to the, the end recipients, this socializing of costs you're attempting to get as much benefit filtered through the programs of the donors into the recipient's hands as you can. And everyone has an opinion about what is the most effective way to do that. And everyone's accounting systems measuring different things. Somebody wants to measure how many girls pass through the door of the clinic. Someone else wants to measure the water quality. Someone else wants to measure, measure malnourished infants. Graduation rates, the highest level of, uh, exactly. of education one can, one can provide. And some of these metrics are in tension with each other. So if you're, if you're measuring how many girls get an education versus the level of, of individual girls, right, you have a bit of a tension because – all of that absorbs money. In, in many respects, as a board member, you're trying to maximize stakeholder value, but recognizing that stakeholder value has a distinction from shareholder value in that you're mm -hmm. trying to make sure that the donors are getting the value that they're seeking, the people on the ground are getting the value that they're seeking, and everybody in between is also maximizing value in 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 the context that that they're defining it as long as it's an adherence to this this overarching mission and not a a personal um you know money grab right so that's, you're, I, I i really like that that's exactly right in some sense you're keeping two sets of books you're or five dealing, sets of books or ten or sets, five of books, sets right? of books and translating from one to the other you are on site you're in uh one of the refugee camps in Jordan for Syrian refugees. It's administered by the United Nations. You as an NGO have a school. The question you have is, how do I get power to the school? And if the United Nations doesn't give you access, you do it yourself. All right. You do it yourself. Now that you've got that and the lights are on, uh, then the recipients of that, they're not on the books for the United Nations because they're on our books and we're attempting to do the best we can. If suddenly we have power from the United, oh boy, then that's in some sense socialized the cost. We've moved the cost off to a standard donor and we can move on to the next thing that would be helpful for the the girls in the in the school. So that is such a great example because again it harkens back to our use of technology. Power being a very, very rare commodity in certain places. You cannot rely on power on high-powered gadgets 
right, in order to provide education. So although in theory, we can computerize the world, I think it was Gates who said, people don't need computers, they need water, right? Yeah. Or they need books, because books, you can, you can unplug a book and it'll still work, right? Yeah. And so um, if, if you just focus on, on power and you use uh, lights that don't draw that much power, and then you put a paper book in someone's hand and you safeguard that book, that book can be used over and over and over again without burdening the, the uh, electrical grid. So the, the solution there is a combination of uh, power, but also not having to use power in order to create the lesson, right? So it might be number two pencils again. Yes, and it, just having light, uh, magical LEDs arrived in the last 20 years, and suddenly you could do something in a remote area which you could not have done before, provide light in the evening for a child trying to read a book. And uh, yes, as the ground shifts, then programs have to shift. Now, how a board functions does matter because... The board's expertise, and generally board members are older, they've had experiences that now may now be 10, 20 years, 30 years out of date. How do they stay aware? So one of the nice things about Relief International's management has been the requirement that the board go to Ghana, where we have a major cooking stove manufacturing operation at a village level, go to Jordan so that the Al-Zatari camp for the Syrian refugees, you can spend days there, be on site, go to Darfur, have the interesting experience of being shaken down by Sudanese corrupt officials. <laughs> but in some ways, those negotiations are very similar to the commercial world, where you're trying to sell something to someone and they're trying to buy it for the least amount and get the most from you. Well, you just know that in that conversation, issues will come up about who's getting paid for what, when. And You've got to answer those questions, whether you're in a nonprofit, an NGO world, or you're in a for-profit world. You know, it's it's really interesting how you um, you are describing what in the Western world would be described as corruption, and maybe it is corrupt, but you're describing it in terms that are very, very similar to what we describe as a non-corrupt commercial world in that everybody is trying to figure out how to knit together an income and they're doing it within their context, we're doing it in our context. If we take out the value judgment, which may or may not be valid, I'm not, I'm not saying it's invalid, but if we take out the value judgment and we look at it as we're going to try and get something done within the context in which we must operate, your visit, which is takes you out of your comfort level, takes it out of your normal environment, and it exposes you to things that you don't necessarily know. How do you ensure that that knowledge transfer is bi-directional, that it is not a neo-colonialist situation where you as the board member are coming out and just sort of having an experience, but instead you're actually shifting your sensibility in a way that almost, it, it won't be perfect, can model somebody who has never left Somalia or never left Ghana, but have them, their presence, their, their spiritual presence, be sitting at the board on that day when you're having those mm. discussions. How do you how do, you do mm. that? Because it's going to be an imperfect process, right? That's absolutely right. There was a, a wonderful exercise about 10 years ago, a learning experience at the World Bank, where they created a task force on corruption and invited for their first meeting, I can't, 40 or 50 people from around the world. Everybody arrives there. Nigeria had a wonderful, at the time, head of the anti-corruption organization in Nigeria. Challenging job. So people arrived in the room. And they started by saying, so let's just look at some behaviors and you're going to mark whether that's a corrupt behavior or not a corrupt behavior. So 
they're on the street, you're driving a car, you're stopped by a policeman at an intersection. So in one case instance they gave, you pay a dollar to the policeman and you're allowed to park someplace. Now, is that corrupt or not? Well, it turns out if you go through 20 of these cases about do you pay a little extra to get ahead in line when you're trying to get a permit? Do you pay a little bit to get a telephone license? What do you pay to get the city? Just what do you pay to get your child into a school? Do you buy a uniform or do you buy a table that was built by the teacher? Do you buy a chair? What, what are the steps it takes? So with 20 or 30 cases from everything from traffic stops to parking permissions to everyone was a giant spectrum of whether that was corrupt or not. If it's your brother working somewhere, do you ask them for a favor so that you could be earlier on? So as it turns out, everyone's sense of what's corrupt is, is varies considerably. And being aware of that allows you then to sit in one of these visits when you're someplace in a completely different society than one you live in. And as you listen to people describe what they do, find out what that local meaning of corruption is. If you want to be effective, you'd better understand that because if someone thinks that this behavior is perfectly all right, when in fact, from your organizational mission, it's totally not all right, then you've got to bridge that somehow, find a way. So, John, is, is with, with all these technologies, and we're, we're coming to the end of our time uh, now, we could talk for another two hours, but uh, uh, we'll, we'll keep it in bite-sized chunks and we'll, we'll, we'll have another discussion um, uh, later on about uh, some of these other issues that you raised. But I have a question about the use of these technologies. Now that we're all so accustomed to working with Zoom, and I'm sure that your all your board meetings are not in person anymore, they're, sure. they're networked in. Has that changed the composition of your board to allow for more participation for people who are on the ground in these different areas that you serve? It has, but I don't think we've really utilized its, its capabilities to the extent we should. So we will hear uh, in the structure of Relief International, we have a, an office in Washington, another one in, in uh, San Francisco, but an office in Washington. And that office and the London office deal with the contracts in these 17 countries where we operate. So the financial side has its hierarchy of financial uh, responsibles in each of the regions and in each of the countries. So they talk a lot amongst themselves about how are we doing? Are we satisfying the donors requirements? There's a lot of conversation there. Almost all of that's invisible to the board. The security forces dealing with Afghanistan attacks and how are we doing? We will hear of incidents every few weeks of someone, some tragedy, and we're, there's a scale of reporting these things. But is someone corrupt? Did we notice money from the microcredit in Pakistan moving into an unknown location? So we'll hear summary reports. But that exposure to the local experience, well, it begins to take up board time. And people on boards are often busy. So um, I, I do think we could add probably a few hours a month of could all say a random sampling of local experience. Uh, in Bangladesh, we have a very large refugee camp. What is the experience day to day in that camp as the as the months as the storms and floods have been encroaching? I mean, you can fill yourself with disaster stories, but the stories you want are are response stories. Did we adequately respond to this? Uh, did how do you measure that? And that I think we need to have more local. Uh, I would love to have, in fact, conversation. I can name four people at this moment in Sudan that I would love to be able to talk with about what's going on there. You know, you're making a really important point. Actually, you're making two really important points in closing. You're making the point that risk risk is really important. The willingness to take risk, the willingness to go where 
things aren't perfect, right? Because that's where the problems are. Where there's no risk, there's probably no problem. There's no challenge. The willingness to go, the willingness to actually lose, to willing, the willingness to be disappointed, the willingness to be educated is so important to the value. There's a real proportion between risk that is judiciously managed, intelligently managed, but the willingness to take risk and the value delivered. The other point that you're making is the openness to learn, to be humbled, to be confronted with your own ignorance, so very important to the success of an organization like Relief Inter International. John Gage, thank you so much as a board member for sharing the work of Relief International. And we've had a very wide ranging discussion. Can we do this again? I would love it. <laughs> yes. John, thank you so much. A great pleasure.